I'm multiracial, black, white. And I'm Andrew Grant Thomas. I'm the other co-founder. Uh, Melissa and I are also partners in real life. Uh, I identify as black or African-American and use he, him pronouns. And very glad to have you all here. So tonight you're here uh, for this webinar called Teaching and Learning About Race, Fantac Fantastic Practice in Early Childhood. It's part of a series that we're doing. There was a previous one and there'll be more. Um, the previous one, it's the whole series about, is about organizing in defense of racial learning. Um, and the first, the last webinar that we had, that was the first in the series was sort of about uh, racial learning in schools, um, you know, past, present, future, sort of the curriculum and the, uh, the non-curriculum ways that kids are learning about race. Um, and today we're delving into great practice um, in early childhood because we embrace race and assume that if you uh, want to raise kids uh, with um, who are healthy and uh, uh, thrive in a multiracial democracy that you need to talk about race uh, because they're noticing it anyway. Um, and in order to not promote the status quo, to sort of change, to make things more just, we need to be able to talk about what they're seeing, what we're seeing, and what we can do. So we're really excited um, to have the two guests that we're having we have on tonight, and Andrew is going to introduce them. Yes, indeed. Um, both guests are people we've rubbed elbows with before, and we're really glad to spend more time with them uh, this evening. Victor Bradley Jr. is an anti-bias and anti-racist educator who believes you're never too young to change the world. Victor, we agree. He has over 30 years of experience teaching in elementary and early childhood settings and over 20 years training and consulting to serve young children, families, and school communities. Victor, thank you for doing that work. In his spare time, because uh, I know you have so much of it, he enjoys music, experiences in nature, cooking, practicing Reiki. He also loves spending time with his 11-year-old daughter, Hazel, and his partner, Sabina. Victor, welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you. And Ver Veronica Reynoso is a mentor teacher at Hilltop Children's Center in Seattle, Washington. She is a first generation Mexican American, born and raised in Chicago, old haunt for us. She's also taught preschool in Chicago and in Seattle. Her life experience and her experiences at Epiphany Early Learning helped shape her strong commitment to anti bias and anti racist education with young children. She has published in Learning Together with Young Children, a curriculum framework for reflective teachers, and in Exchange Magazine. Veronica was also featured in the film Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education in Action, the early years, which uh, we filmed here as part of a special webinar series mm -hmm. and um, met Veronica and uh, think she's awesome. Mm -hmm. Let's start with where we like to begin. The professionals that we typically have on this, like the two of you, um, are it's all it's always personal as well, right? For those of us who do this work, we work in this space, and we like to know um, a little bit about your personal collection connection to the work. So, Victor, let me start with you. Anything you care to share? Yeah. So I grew up in a really sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant town as an African heritage child. And so this, I wasn't surrounded by this work. And um, then I came to Boston, came to school, uh, went to Wheelock, to raise work, um, particularly for young children. And I was like, wow, this is, I just, I just, I just tuned into it right away. And it got me really excited, but then I had to figure out how to do it. And that was, that was challenging. It was not easy at first. I made lots of mistakes. I, uh, you know, tried things out. I called on my mentors um, and then finally started to get slowly, get a, get the hang of it and really got a rhythm and felt very comfortable doing this work. So let me ask, we, we missed you, um, went out for just a few seconds, Victor. You're oh. saying that you went to Wheelock in Boston and that's when you encountered the work. So was it through a course? It was it was a course actually um, an anti bias course that was taken um, and that just turned me on right away. Okay, well we're glad you took that course. Um, Veronica, how about you? Um, as you mentioned when you were introducing me, like I grew up in Chicago, 
and I'm first generation. And I grew up in the neighborhood of Tilson, which um, most of the folks in that neighborhood shared my lived experience were either, you know, immigrants from Mexico or other Latin American countries or first generation. And even when I began teaching, I was teaching in a Head Start program close to Pilsen. So a lot of my students also had the same lived experience I was teaching in Spanish. Um, and then I moved to Seattle because I fell in love um, with my first spring break out here. Um, and then I started teaching at Epiphany. And while I, my lived experience was homogenous in one way in Chicago, it was homogenous in a very different way in Seattle where I did not see my culture as present, um, not in my everyday life or in teaching children. Like uh, I was working in Madrona, which was a very high socioeconomic status school, um, mostly white children. And so it was a whole new world to me. And I, I started professional development and going to our, month, our monthly staff meetings where we were having really intentional conversations about race and anti-bias education and anti-racist education, which was so new to me. And I was confused, I had a lot of questions, but it was also really great to reflect internally and with my peers to start diving into that work. And ever since I just realized how it's just rooted in me and it's a part of who I am and want to continue that work. Okay. So um, people want to know right now, uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about learning about um, race and difference in school. And uh, there are a lot of folks who are particularly um, unsure about it with really young kids, even though you know, kids notice things very early. I mean, we teach them to categorize and they do it themselves, right? Um, so I, I want to kind of dive into sort of the how to do it, some examples and approach. Um, and I want to start uh, with you again, Veronica. You know, what does healthy and appropriate, developmentally appropriate teaching about race look like at this age? So at this age, I think the most important thing that we can do is to listen and to observe. Um, kids are highly capable of having conversations and they're having them with each other. And when they're playing and when they're speaking to one another, they're taking all these snippets that they're hearing, even things that they're not hearing, things that they may be observing. Um, from body language to, you know, we're listening to NPR in the car while they're in the back seat. They're interpreting everything and interpreting theories, and it comes out in their play. Like, mm -hmm. I've had kids outside in a courtyard completely um, unprovoked or anything just sit in a circle where they're reading their newspapers, and mm -hmm. this was around the time that Trump was elected, and they were talking about some of the ideas that he was bringing up. And so a lot of what they're, what they're taking in, they're acting it out in some kind of way. They are playing it out. They're testing their theories. So it's really important for us to observe and listen so that we can respond. And even if we don't have a response right away or might feel uncomfortable with it, for us to really think about it so that we can be intentional in our response to them. So I think that's, that's, that's step number one. Mm -hmm. Um, Victor, you're nodding. I completely agree. Um, I want to echo many things that you said. Um, and I also want to add that one of the things that I really um, got excited about when I started doing this work was doing activism with young children and how developmentally appropriate that was. And when I first started, I never thought that would be a possibility. Um, but when um, President Trump went in the White House, they were going to a lot of marches. Kids were going to women's marches. Mm -hmm. Kids were going to all different kinds of things and standing up with their families. And so it made sense to bring that in the classroom and follow up um, and do things with them. And we end up just talking about Cesar Chavez and then connecting that to today and talking about uh, Burger uh, It was actually it was Wendy's at the time, didn't have uh, produce that was with union organized people that were farmers at the time. So. We ended up writing to Wendy's, we ended up talking to the school about it, we ended up walking up the hall, down the hallways, we were at university at the time, and 
talking professor students and really influencing, feeling really powerful about that. Um, and kids sort of bought that home with them and talked to their grandparents about it, talked to their relatives, talked to their friends that, you know, we shouldn't eat at Wendy's and this is why. So they made these connections that even though they were young, they could make these big changes and also be, feel powerful and feel like they could actually do something to make something happen and be like Cesar Chavez, who they had learned about. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm wondering, you know, when you say, you know, I mean, we know it's true. Of course, we say the same thing. Children are learning very, very early. Um, almost out of the womb, they start, right? They're engaging with race and, and ethnicity and so on, identity generally. And we know, and I'm sure you appreciate too, that there are lots of parents in particular and some educators who will also say, uh, no, no, no. I mean, maybe, you know, young children, some young children, but certainly not my young child, right? And they're just the idea that children are racial innocence, that we need to protect that innocence as long as we can, so don't talk about race. This is especially true of white parents, but not only white parents of white children, right? So I'm wondering, you know, if you and your role as teachers, if you have had those conversations, um, maybe especially in, in Seattle, um, and what do you say? What do you say to try to persuade, to open a parent to the possibility that no, actually even their child is engaging race and therefore we need to engage as well? Veronica, what, what, what do you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I, I point even to the research of children are starting to develop biases even as, as early as six months old. And by the time they're reaching about seven years of age, they're really solidifying their ideologies about racism, about race and class and all the isms. And so I think it's important for us to talk about it in this early age. I, I also point out how you know, a lot of us have this um, framework around the word curriculum. A lot of people think that it's this prepackaged thing, like today we're going to talk about this topic. But the way that anti-bias and anti-racism in this age is developed is, again, we're listening. So it's in response to what children are already saying. It's not like we're bringing up these topics. There are times where we intentionally bring up topics, but it's typically because it's in response to something that children are already talking about before we even bring it up. It is our way of creating a safe environment for children to talk about things because when we are, are hushing things to for the sake of their innocence, we're creating taboos. We're creating a place where they're not going to want to talk about it because they're feeling hushed or like there's something wrong with what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So that's why we, it's really up to us to create that safe environment for open dialogue. And even if we have differing perspectives, that's an important piece of it too, how to engage in conversation with people who have differing perspectives from us in a way that we can have empathy towards one another one, share perspectives and have respect for one another. It's, it's a huge part of the human experience. It's never neat and perfect that we're all learning in this together. Mm -hmm. And so the, the two of the things I heard you say, Veronica, were, you know, one, um, no, really, you know, it's not just you saying so or any of us as individuals saying so. We actually have a mountain of evidence, right, that kids are engaging with race very early. Um, uh, and second, that yeah, even if they're not bringing it up proactively, mm -hmm. that you want to make the space to know, for them to know that it's safe to do so, certainly with you. Mm -hmm. um, Victor would love to hear uh, how you might handle such a thing. And I wonder if you've actually had the experience of having an educator, you know, as opposed to a, someone wearing the parent hat say, what are you talking about? Uh, being a teacher for a long time, I ran into a lot of uh, roadblocks at, at times. And sometimes it was parents, sometimes it was administration, sometimes it was people I worked with or even people that I was supposed to be mentoring. And they had a really difficult time thinking about um, why are we reading this book? Why are we talking about this subject? Why did you answer them in, in that way? And so I always sort of would say, just, you know, at the time, just sit and listen to the child and listen to how I'm talking to them. And then we can talk about it after. And a lot of times, if I do a lot of listening, particularly to a parent who might be upset, who might be confused and, and there's usually, if I keep listening and I keep um, hearing what they're saying, sometimes I find one little thing that they've been hurt in a certain way um, or confused in a certain way, and I can kind of talk about that with them and sort of get them 
more on board. Um, and the same with that teacher. That's what sort of happens. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes the person is not ready. Um, but I also I keep talking about those teachable moments with children. And sometimes there isn't a curriculum. You just are able to just talk about it over lunch when something comes up or somebody says something. And then you get to talk to the parent after school or write an email and talk to them about it in that way. So they are informed about the conversation you had. I feel like keeping parents in the loop all the time is probably the most important thing. And I always offer that to my parents. If a child comes home and says something that they're confused about, let's talk about it the next day. That way we develop a safety between the parent and the adult um, so they feel comfortable with this work as well. It really is important to get parents on board first. The children are ready and thirsty for this work. It's really the parents that you really need to get on board first so they feel comfortable that you're doing this work with their child. Right. That's, yeah, yeah, that's right. And it is part of the work, um, you know, in terms of communicating with the parents, just making it clear, taking good notes on like what's happening in the classroom and making it clear like this is coming up. Like you don't have to say, I'm teaching X, Y, Z. You can be like, the kids are asking about this and we're going to talk like isn't that kind of one of the ways to show yes. parents yeah <laughs> it's a good strategy right absolutely <laughs> yeah it, it seems like um what you're you know or in our first question we were about practice we were asking you know what you do and it seems like um you guys both went to like how do you be as um a teacher in the classroom right and and sort of what are the dispositions that um, that teachers should have sort of going in to do this work? And I think that's not always obvious to people. So I wonder if uh, if you guys can talk about that, um, you know, those ways of being or the self work or what happens. What's the approach before you even enter the classroom? Certainly, we're hearing being receptive, right? right. Meeting both children Listening. and parents where right. they are and being willing to take the conversation forward. And so you both talked about, right, not having a formal curriculum mm -hmm. necessarily, but being available. Yeah, I wonder what are, what are other things. Victor, do you wanna start? Yeah, I, I think the first thing I always think about is, is the school on board that I'm, I'm working at? Is the administration thinking about it? Is there a board involved? Um, are they on board? You sort of need that kind of backing um, as an educator before you even start doing this work. Um, and then really, I always go to books. That's that's my go-to all the time. Um, and fortunately, we're at a great time where there are a lot of great books coming out um, on all these topics. There needs to be more, obviously. Um, we're still lacking, but it's a good time for that. So that's another place that I always go. And then again, listening to, those, listening to kids, listening to conversations, and really like looking at what's happening in the room, like what are kids playing with? What are they attracted to? Um, and sort of going with their lens and, and then explaining. I do something, let's say I was doing something with construction. I would think about, okay, construction workers, what are the stereotypes and what do we want to teach kids about? We want to teach kids about maybe green building and how to do that. Um, are there women in construction? Like what's the gender like? And what, how can and go into parks and how do we do green parks? So just looking at just, you know, the stereotype of a construction man, so to speak, and a construction vehicle, taking them to another level and sort of expanding that. So really just taking where they are and, and pointing out different things to them so they can see different parts of the world. So you're sort of asking what's not being discussed here or who's not being represented. Yes. Yeah. What's absolutely. made invisible and how can I, yeah, elevate it. Or, um, Veronica? I completely agree with everything that Victor was saying. Um, I think it is really important to have to be in the school, you know, where you feel supported and where you feel safe to do this work. So having, you know, your ed your administrator support and family support is really important. Um, I think another piece of it too is, you know, we're doing this work in tandem with children, but there's it's a cycle of reflecting with your peers, with children, and doing a lot of internal reflection, thinking about things like, huh, that moment made me feel un a little uncomfortable. What, why is that? Or um, something stumped me, why is that? And remembering that sometimes you don't have to have an immediate response. So sometimes there are moments where you can have a short-term response or moment, whether it's I have an answer or I'll get back to you on that. And then you can elaborate with a more long-term response to dive a little bit deeper. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, 
there's there's a lot of of things just happening simultaneously. I do agree that books are a wonderful um, tool, and it's it brings up so many conversations that you wouldn't realize would come out of even simple children's books like that aren't necessarily tied to race. Um, I remember a child have we had a really great conversation about why do um, the male presenting um, characters in this book have lines for mouths instead of lips where the where the female presenting characters had like the full lips and they're like they have colored cheeks like blush um and i would also say that we ourselves as educators and as people in the classroom are a huge provocation of conversation in and of itself i find that when i'm freely myself and talking about just who I am with children and with families, it brings up um, conversations. Uh, for example, I, I've, I've done boxing for five or more years and that's brought up conversations about gender roles and um, it brought up conversations about consent because a kid told me, uh, my parents told me that fighting is wrong. So we talked about how you can do that in places where you have everyone's permission to do it. Um, so. I think we in and of ourselves, if we are comfortable with being vulnerable with who we are, we're also inviting children and families to be vulnerable with us. And you know, and I wonder if um, I'm thinking of, you know, little Victor, right? And little Veronica as kids, you know, young children, um, probably not getting the kind of support that you're offering your students because almost none of us did and relatively few kids do now. Uh, and I'm wondering what's at stake, right? So you think about what if you had had one or more teachers who are trying to do what you are trying to do, right, with your students and other educators, you know, Veronica, you mentioned sort of the community of educators supporting each other and, you know, all of bouncing things past each other. What's at stake? There. There is a lot at stake in terms of our identity and who we are. And, you know, a part of why I do this work is because I'm trying to turn all the no's that I got into yeses for the children that I work with. Um, there are things up to like last year, I have let my peers and my students call me Veronica, where I was raised by two Spanish speaking parents who didn't speak any English. My name is Veronica. It isn't until last year where I'm just like, why am I still allowing people to call me by my name in English? There are little little things like that that you don't realize really impact your identity and how you bring yourself forward out into the world. So I think that children having the support and being comfortable in who they are helps them be comfortable with the world around them and just creates just such a much more empathetic and genuine human experience where we're all able to care for one another in a much more authentic way um, mm -hmm. and celebrate one another and be there for each other in, in a way I can't even imagine. Thank you so much. Victor, what do you think? I think that's why I became an early child educator, to sort of set a different tone and set up an environment where all children feel included. Um, that was the most important thing. I always felt like I was other or left out or um, wasn't in the right place all the time and trying to fit in to a place that I could never fit into. Um, so I really don't want children to feel that way. And if they do feel that way, I want them to be able to tell me they feel that way too, to have that space so they can be like, this isn't right. Like, I don't feel comfortable here and I can change it. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, big reason why. Just why people feel more comfortable. Right. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. sort of sure. Two questions. Um, and wondering about, you know, people asking for specific um, things to do in relation to parents. Um, like, is there something that when you start off the year, in order to kind of bring kids' cultures into the classroom, um, you know, do you send out a parent questionnaire? Do you, what, what are sort of your favorite ways for uh, winning the parents over or to, you know, getting them involved in this curriculum early? Um, Victor, you, would you like to, yes. 
Sure, yeah. Um, I usually start my year with a curriculum night and really just go through explicitly what what we're going to talk about, we're going to do. My room is also very, you walk in the room and you know something big is going to happen with the posters on the wall. Um, so when parents come in, maybe they never come till that till the curriculum night, they never in the room. Um, so that's a big deal. The next thing I, I do is I invite parents to come in um, and talk about their family traditions. And that was a game changer when I used that term. When I was having parents, inviting parents to come in and talk about, you know, their holidays or whatever it was, was um, and come in and do something. It always was the families of colors. Um, a lot of Jewish families would come, some Muslim families would come, but the white families and European families would be left behind. They wouldn't feel like they had a, a culture or some something, there was something missing. They didn't feel included. They feel like they didn't have anything to offer. But once I turned it to family traditions, everyone felt like they could come and talk and, you know, read a story or, we bake bread like every week or we go on a fall crunchy walk um, in September as a family every year. Um, and photographs and books about that. So then we got to see each family's platform and who they were and each child got to feel proud of that. I think those kind of setups set up this environment where everyone feels heard, everyone feels thought about. So when you're doing some of the harder work or some of the controversial things come up that some people get scared about, you can go back to, we all know each other. We're all, you know, in this together. You already have some currency, some, yeah, some of the relationship. Veronica? Yeah, similarly to Victor, I do a lot of uh, what Victor has done. Um, even from enrollment, like we're, we're asking parents about what is important to them as a family, what are traditions that are important to them, what, um, what makes their ch like child special to them, and who they are outside of school, like who are they as a family. We're really trying to show that we're trying to not only get to know your child, but who you are as a family. It's, it's not just about the child, it's about the whole family. And building those relationships is critical. Um, as Victor had mentioned before, you're partnering with families, you're letting them be a part of this and continually having conversations with them. Because when you, when you get to those harder pieces, the strength of the relationship becomes so important because I believe that the stronger your relationship is, the more you're able to hold tension um, together and actually grow together afterwards. Um, I see my strong relationships as the ones where I can have hard conversations. I think um, it shows the depth of, of our relationship. Um, so we, we really want to invite them at the start of the year, have gatherings, invite them out with us, share stories, um, around birthday, sometimes we'll ask about, you know, share a little bit more about your family and how, how you celebrate this. Um, we don't want things to be at a surface level. We want to dive deeper into, into these traditions and what they mean for them. Now, I love the, the picture you're both painting of, right, it's really actually so subversive in an incredibly healthy way, right? You think about education, right, the standard model of education uh, in this country where, where the students are sitting down, they're all in chairs, they're facing forward. You know, the teacher is clearly the authority in the room. The teacher typically doesn't share of themselves, right? Um, it's always a very professional face, but you, know, you both talked about bringing yourself into the classroom and your, your experiences, your, and then inviting them to do the same, right? Um, and again, not just, you know, as they, who they are in a limited sense sitting in the classroom, but yes, family traditions. Um, it just, it's, it's democratizing, right? That child, that classroom space in a way that is inherently empowering compared to what we, again, traditionally have done with students, especially little kids. Um, so that's really wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm super curious, um, Veronica, I told you I would ask you this. You were featured in that film, uh, that wonderful film I mentioned in introducing you reflecting on anti-bias education in action, the early years. Wonderful film. I know it's gotten a lot, a lot, a lot of views. And I'm wondering what that's meant for you and your trajectory as an educator to get that attention be featured in that way. Yeah, um, it's been an incredible opportunity um, to be a part of that film. Uh, when I was going to college for my undergrad in early childhood education, I that was a part of my 
my course, I watched the movie, the original one. And I remember watching that and just being like, there's a lot that has happened since then. Um, and, you know, this work is, it's, it's ongoing. It's always growing. It's always changing. We're always learning more. Um, so to be a part of this new um, adaptation of it over 10 years later and to really show the work that is being done now has has been amazing. As much as I don't like being faced like the, the front facing person, it's, it's really motivating to inspire other educators to do this work, um, to have people asking, how do we get support from our admin? How do we get support from our families to do this work? Because you know, just, just that first step is so crucial and important to, to get the ball rolling on, on doing this work together and to be able to provide this for children and our families and to help everyone feel supported. So it, it truly has been a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk with more educators from all over the world and, and have these critical conversations. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, okay. If you haven't seen the film, you should see it. It's incredible. It's yeah, I just film. put in the uh, in the chat, you know, we did an interview with a couple of the teachers and uh, with Debbie Lee Keenan and John Nemo, who uh, sort of produced the film. And there's a, I put that in the chat because there's a link to the film, the film and resources and all that are available um, for free. It's great. Now, Vic, let me come to you with this question because it picks up on a thing you very specifically named before. Lillian wants to know, what specific community activism can a preschool or kindergarten school do uh, for both the children and the parents so everyone's involved? Now, you, of course, talked about talking about your kids' activism and your family's activism. Yeah, I think um, looking at your community, looking at what children's interests are, looking at what your interests are. I always tell teachers and parents, what are your passions? Because if you bring your passions to them, they'll be excited about it. They want to learn from you. They want to be around your excitement. Um, so if it's like rebuilding a park, like a park that's not doing well, let's say, right? And so going there and cleaning it up, putting gloves on, getting like things so kids are safe and having adults there too. And then writing a letter to the mayor of that city and saying, we want to cl we clean up the park, take pictures. And then all of a sudden now, we're thinking about, oh, the playground arrangement's a little broken. Let's see what we can do for a fundraiser. Let's see what we can do to help out with that park. And that's community action right there. And families get involved, schools can get involved, um, but really it's wherever your passion lies. Where do you see that needs uh, help in your community? And kids, uh, so many kids love being treated like people who can make change happen, right? Do. It doesn't have to be huge change, but it's like, oh, hey, you're looking to, you wanna know my ideas? You want to know, right? You're encouraging me to do something amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, Donna has a good question here. Um, so sometimes we have, have this debate sometimes uh, when we talk about starting with where the kids are because some teachers can use that as an excuse not to talk about things, right? Like uh, Victor, you gave that example of um, the construction worker, well, you saw all these things that were invisible to the kids and sort of brought them forward. We're not talking about, you know, where is race and implicated? Where is gender? Where is that? So all these things. Um, so, so it can be a way to sort of not give kids the information. People can limit themselves by saying, we're only going to do what the kids actually say and what, and, and in, you know, parentheses and what I'm comfortable with. So Donna asks, um, she says, I totally agree and understand the primacy of listening and responding with curriculum. But given that our kids are swimming in the water of our culture all the time, don't we also need to proactively introduce concepts around race and racism, including structural racism? If you agree, I'd love to hear more about how you do that. Anyone want to take that? It's a great um, question. Yeah, I mean, if, Victor, I think you gave a great example, but Veronica? Yeah. Um, I think in listening, there is listening to what they are saying, but I think there's the other side of it and listening to what they're not talking about. Um, because I think that when, you, when you're seeing these gaps um, of, 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 their, of their lived experience and knowledge, then you're able to use things like books or 
using your own um, lived experience, because I know that working at one of my experiences in working with a mostly so large uh, high socioeconomic status group of children was that they kind of had this extreme version of you either have a house and you have everything that you need or you're homeless. Like those, that, that was brought up a lot in my classroom. That, it was that two extremes. And there is so much in between. And we wound up talking a lot about, um, you know, what it means to need and want. Um, what, like I, I shared, you know, that when I was a kid, like I would go with my mom and go get our stuff from Wix, get our welfare food. So, I, and I was well, I had everything I needed, but it didn't mean that I had a house. I lived in an apartment. They think everyone had a car. I'm like, I walk to work. They're like, why don't you have a car? And I'm like, I don't need one right now. And honestly, I can't afford one. Like it's, it's bringing up those honest conversations and being able to share mm -hmm. what they're not talking about and what they might not be seeing um, and, and thinking critically with your co-teachers and um, other teachers and other thinking partners that you might have that uh, might be able to ha share new perspectives with you that you can also share with other, with the children and with families. And it'll really inform conversations that you also want to have with parents. Um, so I, it's, it's, all, it's all done in, in conversation to, to make sure that we're, we're addressing those things that they might not be talking about and not seeing that eventually, you know, they are going to learn about and as, as they move on through the world. And picking up on that, you know, the one general uh, theme, I think, through the conversation and through what you've both said mm -hmm. is this idea of essentially, you know, de-normalizing -normal what we see, right? So, Veronica, you talked about the books, right? And who's in the book? Who's not in the book, right? Whose story is it? It's told from whose perspective? Who wrote the book? Mm -hmm. Not just this book, but let's look across the pattern of books are there patterns yes who you know what's the gender and racial demographics of construction workers broadly speaking of the presidency right of yeah. you know senator whatever like you know of, of teachers yeah. of teachers in the in schools and, right. right so and then right if we if they they will notice that if they haven't already they certainly will you know explicitly if uh, if only implicitly now and that's such a wonderful starting point right well why is that why is that? Let's, you know, let's do a little bit of research or let's mm -hmm. talk about why that might be. Is it only about people's preferences, you know, individual preferences? It's not only about people's preferences, right? And that, you know, to again, just, I think, Victor, you said it, following then kids' curiosity. And as you said, if you're interested, right, if the adult is interested and also a learner, mm -hmm. then this is something we can do together. But Victor, what, what, what do you think? That's just what I was hearing from some of what you said. No, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with everything. I also think that we can also influence them by not just by modeling who we are, but also inviting people that you know, people that other teachers to come in the room that they know um, to talk about their life and, and their challenges and their struggles. Um, I think part of the reasons why I, to our teaching about people of inspiration like Cesar Chavez is because I wanted people to know that there can be challenges and life can be really hard, but there can be a good outcome too sometimes. Um, and then they're, they're sort of, their early childhood brains are very black and white, just like Veronica said. Um, and so we're trying to develop gray as parents and as educators. Um, so they sort of see that, oh, it's not just that and that, it's actually this too. Um, so I feel like telling these stories and having different diverse um, people talk to them and have and sharing your own life, your own experiences really helps to develop more of that gray. So uh, lots of questions coming in. Um, can one of you give an example of how race came up and what you did to follow through? Um, so maybe, it, I wonder if you guys have an example. I mean, again, I don't know how far your conversation went about living in houses or apartments, but um, it might not start with them talking about race, but race is there, race is always there. So I wonder if um, either of you, and so you have to, it's true that the adult has to be 
willing to go there. Um, if either of you have an example of how that came up and how you sort of supported a conversation about race, that would be great. Um, kind of going off of uh, what Victor was saying earlier um, in how we're filling in the gray, I've had multiple in, um, moments during like circle times and individual conversations with kids where they um, look at me and they're like, well, you're black, right, Veronica? And I'm just like, no. So <laughs> there's, there's that conversation where we're diving deeper into what race means and the spectrum and the intersectionality of it all. Um, and even there are children who, um, like who were multicultural and had, um, or biracial or multiracial, who did not know that they were children of color. So it was really diving deeper into what that means and how it's a part of our identity um, and partnering with families again in having those conversations. Um, and, and that in and of itself, the fact that, that children, you know, we had children who were just like, I, like, I'm not a child of color, like I'm white, um, was another way for, to, to really bring families in because uh, most of these families that I knew were really proud of their culture and their race and wanted to, were then like spurred by these conversations of like, where they were surprised to hear their children say this. So it really engaged for their conversation into what, what it all meant for, for us and, and what it meant for our identities and our culture. I think you're muted. Yeah, you're still muted. You're still muted, yeah. Sorry okay, about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's a great example. We have uh, someone asking you, Veronica, I'm curious about your thoughts on young students who embrace the Englishified pronunciations of their names. Last year, I used the family's pronunciation of a student's name, but all of their friends didn't, and they seemed to prefer that at school. Can you repeat that question one more time, that last part? Yeah, so, um, so the teacher tried to use the original pronunciation of the name, but the uh, student and their friends use the English, you know, the Veronica versus Veronica. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this teacher is wondering, should I just go with what they in fact seem to prefer at school or should I respect the original pronunciation? It felt awkward. Mm -hmm. I, that's an excellent question. And I think that that is, that is one where you truly do have to partner with the family because I think it's, it is, you want to honor the child and the child's uh, choice, but you also want to check in with the family because like I, I sometimes think about, you know, I, I grew up in, a mostly Spanish speaking um, population. And I went to school with children who all spoke Spanish and looked like me, but all my teachers were white. So I was hearing my name in English and all my friends' names in English. And when I think about like the impact of that, not just on me, but also on my parents. Like I, I think of how that must have impacted their experience coming from Mexico to the US to hear their names and their child's names in English and what, what that impacts for, for them. And so I think that that's a, a conversation to have you know, with the child, with the family, because I think you can all come to something together because I, I, as I want to honor the child and at the same time, I wonder what impacts that can have if we just default to the English pronunciation. Um, so I, I don't have a solid answer. It, and, and that is uh, sometimes the case because it is so imperfect, but I think that is a piece where it is going to, to really call for partnering with families to, to come together to, with an answer. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I wonder, uh, Victor, that we've gotten some questions about um, what you do if you're, um, you aren't in a supportive environment for doing this work. Um, if, if you're in fact in an environment where it's challenged. And I wonder if you have worked with educators in that position. I have, and I, I keep bringing it back to um, have everybody feeling safe every and back to kindness that really that's really what it's about and people so often think oh you're putting things in kids heads or you know this is too radical or they don't understand but it's really just about kindness and treating everyone well and learning about other people and learning about people in their classroom um who they are who they're with every day and and families there's such a diverse amount of families um even if your school looks predominantly white let's say right um there's a huge diversity in that even. So I think it's such a missed opportunity not to, to be doing the work. And I do a lot, like when people are really upset and really confrontational, I just listen, just listen and listen and listen um, and really hear what they're saying um, and try to sort of figure out where, where that hurt. I think I talked about this a little earlier, where that pain is or where that, that confusion is. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, but what I've done is I've, you know, I've read books. I've had those conversations uh, when they've come up and I've explained why I've had those conversations. Um, I remember I was at a school that actually had a, a gay pride assembly every year. And um, the parents loved the school and they enrolled their child in the school and they were all fine with all the other social justice work we were doing. But when it came to the gay pride assembly, they were like, we're gonna keep our family home. And I said, oh, why? And so we talked about it and I said, how about if you don't feel comfortable having your child, how about you just come? You come to the Gay Pride Assembly, you and your partner. And they agreed. And so they came and then they were crying at the end and said, why did we think that something was gonna be wrong with this? Why did we not trust that you were gonna be developmentally appropriate here for the whole school and for all the kids? Mm -hmm. um, so that was a win, that situation. That but, I, win, yeah. but I did respect their, their I had their child stay home with a grandparent. and not come because they were so uncomfortable um and i wanted to meet them sort of halfway mm -hmm. and i'm so glad they were able to come and see the assembly sometimes that's not always the case but yeah, i got lucky you halfway time. too yeah you no know, victor this this uh touches on a conversation we had before and sort of preparing for this session where you know you said i think it's you in particular who said you know a lot of really a lot of parents and others you know obviously a part of the context of this conversation is this anti-crt struggle right in this attempt to, to squash discussion about race in history and in the present um and in that context we were saying and you were saying you know part of the problem is a lot of people have this really fear-based idea about what we're talking about mm -hmm. right what is happening what is happening and and i think you said come on in right let's talk about what's happening because if you see what we're talking about it's very likely that few of you would think this is some horrible fear. It's like, oh, just like, yes, they showed up to the assembly, the pride assembly. It's like, oh, <laughs> this is lovely. There's no issue here. Um, so I think that's a huge piece. Of course, some parents will be, would be upset, presumably, to know what you might be saying. Um, and it brings up a, one other thing I wanted to, to, to lift up. Listening to both of you, right? You're both really experienced. You're really good about what you do you're very thoughtful you put in the work you are not now presumably who you were when you started this journey right and i think a real challenge for a lot of teachers is making that transition not that we ever arrive right we continue to do the work of course but there is this area perhaps earlier in your careers early in your work where Yes, you're making uh, more, let's call them mistakes, right? Or having more you know, conversations you wish you had framed differently. And there are a lot of educators and we certainly meet, meet some uh, who say, well, two things. One, parents who say, gosh, I don't know if I want a teacher sort of practicing on my child, right? Mm -hmm. um, and educators who, are, who fear putting their foot in it mm -hmm. because yeah, they're not what they will become if they I know with greater experience. Just any words of wisdom for those, let's call them educators in transition. Veronica, let's start with you. 
sometimes it's not what you want to hear, but the fact is you're going to mess up. Um, and that's a part of this work. It is messy. It is imperfect. And it's all about learning side by side together with the children and with families. Um, I think that you, that we really have to shift our minds from thinking of mistakes as a deficit. Um, mistakes are how we grow. We, we can be comfortable and that's fine, but we're not gonna grow in a place of comfort. Um, we need to be uncomfortable and we need to embrace discomfort because it's that discomfort that leads to this fear. Um, it's the unknown that creates fear. So dive deep into it. Um, get messy and just really get into this work, even if it's just dipping a toe, eventually you'll be submerged. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with that. And that, like you said, that discomfort is when you know sort of like things are happening. I think if it, everyone's comfortable and feels safe, then you're really not moving things. And I think that's why it's so important to develop relationships with families and with your teaching team, really having an open dialogue with them. And I, I always sit down with my team at the beginning of the year and say, so, you know, I'm probably going to say sexist things. I don't want you to call me out on it. And you might say racist things to me. So I hope we have permission to call you out on it. So you have to start from the base of your team and then with the parents and then with the children and sort of have this place where people can be messy mm -hmm. right. and clean it up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's a question. Our nursery school, Caitlin's asking, is interested in having a community read for the parents and educators around anti-racism. Is there a book you find particularly useful for parents of this age group? Or maybe just resources? I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the movie that you're in and all those anti-bias resources are a good, uh, a certainly a good place to start. Um, anything else? I mean, I have a lot of books and I, I can't, I mean, I have my mentors, right? And they have books and they're great. And I think, I think for people though, they have to sort of find that book where it resonates with them um, and what book they're drawn to. Um, there's always, I know for myself, it was the anti-bias curriculum book when I was at Wheelock. That was the book that really caught me. And I keep that always and still refer to it and recommend it to people, uh, educators and parents. It, it's really great. Um, the other book that I always keep near me and close is Beyond Heroes and Holidays, um, mm -hmm. um, which is another great book by Enid Lee and others. Mm -hmm. um, so those are sort of the, that's my, those are my books from the old school and they've been around for a long time and they're still great books. And I feel like parents and educators can use those books. Mm -hmm. them think. Veronica, do yeah, you have I, yeah. That was the one, the anti-bias curriculum one is the one that I refer to, but I, to I definitely agree with Victor because there are books written from different perspectives. And um, so I think you really have to find the one that does resonate with you um, to help guide your practice and also in working with children. I think, um, and, and even the ones that you don't resonate with, like even with children and with adults, like there are times where I'm like, I think it, it can be important to look at things that you might not resonate with to kind of understand why not also, and to gain new perspectives. So I think it is important to, to really look for multiple resources written through different lenses. Right, and to consider what they're talking about a community, the demographics of the community and the experience the community, I guess. You know, I'm thinking I'd love to hear from both of you on your perspective on what's happening in the country and what's going on. I mean, where we're going, right? So specifically, again, obviously we have um, some retrenchment, right? We have some, a real pushback against the kind of work that you do, for example, the kind of work that we do. And at the same time, we have a lot of people, I mean, it's polarizing here too, as in so many other ways, right? Where you have a lot of people who are actually picking up this mantle and really appreciating in many cases, we need to do this work. Um, you know, we've seen our membership grow, right? Significantly over the last two years. 
because more parents and educators are saying, I know this is important, I just don't know how to do it. Um, so can, can you help? So both things are happening at once. Um, what are you seeing? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, what, what's, what, what's, me, what's leaving you hopeful? I think for me that the word anti-racist is on the news every night, um, excites me that that's not a word that people before were like, oh, oh we can't, oh, Victor, don't write that in the newsletter. Like those are things that, you know, you know say something different. Um, now that's a word in our society. People are starting to look at it. whether they like it or not, it's here. And that gets me really excited. It gets me excited that people, friends of mine who I've known for years are now asking me if I'm okay when things go wrong. And they never even did that before, right? And um, and they're becoming more aware of just things in the world, which their world was very closed before. They were just going to work and coming home. And um, they didn't really see any of the work that I did important even. Um, so now they're like, wow, this is really important that you're doing this work. And they're commenting on Facebook or, you know what I mean? It's just, I feel like that's exciting to me that people have sort of um, their eyes are open, their lenses have changed. Instead of using the word woke, I use lens change and that their lenses have gotten sharper and they're seeing things differently now. Um, that that excites me. That's wonderful, thank you. Monica? Yeah, ditto on all of that. Um, you know, we, we're seeing people polarizing from one another um, and that is the importance of this work is that we, we are ho we're trying to build empathy in these children so that they can talk about you know, anti-racism and be supportive of one another so that we are filling the gray and uh, also just creating a much more empathetic and caring human experience. Um, so I think that with children learning this way, we're going to move away from that polarizing um, perspective that's currently happening. So I really want to set children up for success that way. And in the same way that it's exciting to hear, you know, anti-racism in the news every day, it's also exciting to hear, you know, my friends who are now starting to have kids ask me questions about um, and ask me for tips about how to talk to their children about it. Um, because it's like, I, I always have heard about it, obviously, as this is what we're doing in school, but now it's, it's really going into everyday life, everyday conversation. And the fact that we're talking about this every day um, with friends, with family, with educators from all over the world, it's, it's, we're talking about it. And that's the most important part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys Thanks. give us hope. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, just being, doing the work we do, we see hard things, but we see all the people doing the work, you know, it's really impressive and we learn a lot. So. And actually, you know, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our uh, Color Break community, which is an early childhood community for parents, educators, others who care, especially for BIPOC, right? Black Indigenous children and children of color who are young, zero to eight. Mm -hmm. uh, we have that community um, and you can find out more about it on our website. But I mention it now because in the uh, fall, we're going to have a summit um, on exactly this, sort of celebrating the work and the people doing the kind of work that you do. Uh, so please, uh, for Victor, Veronica, and for those watching, those interested, stay tuned. We'll let you know more about that. But there's a lot of great and inspiring work and wonderful people doing it. So. Uh, please don't lose lose heart. And I want to shout out to Louise Derman Sparks, who's uh, in the in the chat there. Um, anything by Louise Derman Sparks, you should read. That would be a great place to start. Um, we will include all of the resources mentioned um, in in the transcript and all that. We'll send it, that to all of you, and it'll be on our website. So don't worry, you won't lose anything. Thank you so much, Victor and Boromika. Huge appreciation really for your coming and especially for the work that you do every day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for